Hello, everyone. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Is that uh, a little too loud? Or is that okay? Or Yeah, okay. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, praise the Lord. Let's ask for his continued blessing upon uh, our, t- our night and our, our lives. And Father in heaven, we are calling upon you, Lord, not just for this time, but for our lives, that we would recognize that you are the Lord of glory, that you're with us tonight. Lord, that we would uh, accept the idea, the knowledge, the truthfulness that you love us and that your love is here for us and that your grace is empowering us to live a life that is worthy of the kingdom. It is by your spirit that we're here today. It's by your spirit that we're saved and we even have a, a proper awareness of the kingdom of God. It's by your spirit that we have this church called MVC. It's by your spirit that we understand salvation and the Bible and the Holy Spirit and the, and the redemption and all the things that you have done for us. You search out. The Holy Spirit searches out. And we look to you today, Lord of glory, that you would open up our hearts and minds, that we would understand the deep things of God, that we wouldn't just hear it and then walk away as though we didn't hear anything. But Lord, that we would receive, absorb, digest, and make it part of our very lives that you'd help us, Lord, and prepare us for the kingdom that's coming, that already you have deposited in our own hearts. Help us, Lord, to look past the things of this world and look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. I pray that tonight is a blessing. Lord, as we go over this lesson plan, that it would settle deep into the souls of every person here and every person who ever listens to this on KQI. Lord, through this website and through this camera, that, that something would happen in people's lives no matter how long it's on there, that someone would hear, listen, learn of the Holy Spirit in their lives and come to understand what it means to be the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Bless the young ones who are here tonight. Lord, that it wouldn't just be Wednesday night church and that's where we go, but you would touch their lives and prepare them, Lord, for the life that you have for them. Lord, it's in your precious name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. All right, as you know, we have been dealing with the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. And uh, we talked last time, which was uh, two months ago, I believe, in regards to fellowship and disunity. Fellowship and disunity, mentioning to you that wherever you have fellowship, there's also going to be the danger of disunity, and confrontation will always arise because there's uh, devils that abound. There's flesh nature that is constantly present. There's disharmony, there's disunity, there's discontent. There's, there's things that are always operating to disturb and to cause problems, and confrontations will be there. It just, it's, a, it's a natural understanding, and I mentioned to you last time that wherever you have a yes and you say yes, there has to be an equal corresponding no. That your yes is only as strong as the corresponding no that goes with it. If we say yes to the Lord, then our, we cannot say yes to also the world. If we say yes to the Spirit, we cannot also be saying yes to the flesh. We cannot live in both worlds and just say, well, the God understands. He does understand. And he's calling for a decision. And that decision means not everybody's going to be happy with it. Maybe you've noticed that that the minute you make a decision, that's why people have lack of decision or indecision. Uh, their, their decisions are oftentimes in a state of flux because they have difficulty in dealing with the idea of the fallout, people falling away, people attacking, people offended. It just happens, well, that offends me, and immediately they're backpedaling. You even see great preachers and, and well-known ministers who will make a very bold statement as they're talking to a multitude of people, then all of a sudden, within the next day or a few days, someone's bringing it up and saying, well, how come you said that? Are you saying that you meant this? And they go on to attack, and they start backpedaling. Maybe you've noticed that, that oftentimes there's a, there's a fallout to these things, and we have a tendency to be very, very bold until we're caught, until we're brought, it's brought to our attention or surfaced, or we all of a sudden get confronted. And many times, the Christian the believer starts backpedaling, I don't want to offend, I don't want to say, gee, I should have said it, I didn't mean to hurt your feelings, well, it's just what I believe, I didn't mean to offend you, it's what I believe. And they take the edge off things, rather than, why don't you just, right from the very beginning, speak the truth in love? 
speak the truth in love, meaning not doesn't have to be uh, dripping with honey. Oftentimes we mistake uh, sincere, crying, sympathetic type, weak type voices with love. You know, I really meant to. When in actuality, uh, speaking the truth in love means that you're not doing it for yourself. You're seeking their welfare. You're seeking their benefit. You're seeking that they would come into a state of wholeness. We oftentimes judge people's hearts by the words that they come out of their mouth rather than realizing that the words should be judged by their heart and their heart is displayed in daily life. So there is a, a difficulty in church world and fellowship, but we are looking at the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. And since it's fellowship, and we talked about what fellowship means, and it is with the Holy Spirit, then we have to recognize that his fellowship has to be, number one, holy, since he's holy, and it will also be spiritual, since he is spirit. We have to recognize that, and we addressed that last time. Confrontations will always arise. Please understand that that when you are looking for the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, confrontations will always arise. And if you're looking to be in fellowship with the Holy Spirit, if you're looking to be one with the Holy Spirit, remember fellowship is participation, it's incorporated in the body, you're one with, then there's going to be difficulties that arise and confrontation will always be there. Divisions will arise because human nature, as we addressed last time. We also dealt with Fellowship of the Holy Spirit means communion, and you will always deal with devils. If you're dealing with the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, you will also be dealing with devils. We oftentimes don't want to address that in churches today, or it is addressed so often it loses its impact, that there's a devil under every rock, and everybody's got the devil, and, everybody's a, and they're constantly searching more for devils than they are the Spirit. And uh, you've got people who are out to try to prove their spirituality by being devil hunters. And uh, instead of recognizing that the Lord said to, to seek him out, that's what we're, you don't have to look for devils. They'll show up. I've, I've known ministers and people who are hungry to be uh, proving their spirituality. Now, they don't say that, but they're out to battle the devils and they're out to seek them out and find them and deliver people and that's all they talk about read books about and you don't have to search for them you just seek out the lord and you'll find he'll be right in front of you they'll be all over you and the ones who have been plaguing you all your life will show up as well so all you have to do is seek out the lord and communion with him fellowship with him but know that you will be dealing with devils as we talked about last time in our last class. Now, tonight I want to start with fellowship and the Holy Spirit in dealing with darkness, darkness. Let's turn in our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5 to begin with, and there's numerous scriptures that need to be addressed in regards to fellowship with darkness. But let's begin with Ephesians chapter 5, And since we'll be going through a variety of scriptures, you may find it easier to just jot those scripture verses down and look at them at a later time. Hopefully that is done. You know how easy it is to write them down. Say, I'll look at them when I get home. And then when you get home, you never look them up. And then you start saying, well, I've got them whenever I need them. And then something else goes on. And, you know, it never turns into a study uh, or rarely does. So fellowship of the Holy Spirit and darkness. Dealing with darkness, we dealt with dealing with uh, disbelievers, unbelievers, we dealt with dealing with devils. Now tonight we're dealing with darkness, dealing with darkness. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 11 says, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. Pretty simple what it's telling us there, don't you think? That have How much fellowship? No fellowship. None. That it is is not of the Spirit. Have no fellowship. You're not participating with, in fellowship with, darkness. Unfruitful works is what it says. Unfruitful works. But it says rather than having fellowship with them, what are we actually supposed to be doing? Is it just doing nothing? But it says to expose them, to bring them to the surface, that that anyone who's living a fellowship of the Holy Spirit life, 
you will find that this darkness will bubble up just by you being there. That you'll be that, that person who is that presence that is causing problems, and it, it does cause problems. So have no fellowship with these unfruitful works of darkness, but rather to expose them and to recognize that that must take place. In that same Ephesians chapter 5, look at verse 6, just to get a better understanding of all that's taken place here. It says, to let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. The wrath of God is coming. And there are those who are deceiving. And remember, he's writing to the church. And this isn't just those wicked people who don't have God in the world that we oftentimes so blame as the problems for everything. This is happening right inside the church. And he's warning that there's devils. There's disbelievers, meaning unbelievers, those who don't have Christ, which we talked about. But now we're talking about darkness that you're not to have a fellowship with, but rather expose it right in amongst your own life. It says in chapter, uh, first, uh, chapter 5, verse 7, to not be partakers. Therefore, do not be partakers with them in verse 7. Participating. Taking part in. Taking part in. A variety of evil works that take place that go on that we partake of and become part of. Because remember that whatever you join yourself with, whatever you participate with, whatever you align yourself with, that's what you become. That's what you serve. And he's warning us to be careful, to not get caught up in this. But it says in chapter 5, verse 8, you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Therefore, walk as children of light. There's the darkness of this world. And someone who is walking in accordance with this world will also be walking in darkness, darkened mind, darkened hearts, darkened morality, where the light doesn't shine. And he's warning the church in Ephesus to be careful. The Holy Spirit is also capturing this for us and saying that we also need to be aware of this. Now, darkness, the world, absolutely. But when you have someone who has tasted of the Lord and is walking in fellowship with the world in darkness, it's saying to not participate and be part of as well, lest you also be caught up in this. Verse 15 of chapter 5, verse 15 of chapter 5, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, meaning be wise. Know your surroundings, know where you're stepping, Know where you're going. Know what is taking place in your life. That darkness is where you stumble. In the darkness is where you stumble. That, that when you get up in the middle of the night and you're tripping over even the edge of a carpet because you didn't see it, a step, a threshold, you bump into the door. Why all these things are happening where we stumble because there's an element of darkness where you can't see clearly. And so there's a separation that takes place, a withdrawing from darkness. How? by having light. Turn in now to 1 John. 1 John. Go to the ends of the Bible to the letter 1 John. Whereas a powerful, powerful section of Scripture is given by the Apostle John in regards to walking in fellowship and being in fellowship with the Holy Spirit, fellowship of Christ, fellowship of the Lord. And he says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 3, First, he says, 1 John chapter 1, verse 3, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you. He's saying here that he's writing to them and says that what I'm declaring to you, I saw, I heard the transfiguration of the Christ. The, I walked among them. I heard him speak. This is what I'm declaring to you, that you also may have fellowship with us. Looking to have fellowship with them means to not be in fellowship with darkness. Fellowship with devils, as we talked about last time from 1 Corinthians. Not to be in fellowship with the things that aren't of the Lord, but to separate ourselves from. That you also may have fellowship with us. He's not looking to set up a clique or a club, saying, well, it's just the apostles and that's it. It's just apostles and deacons and a few selected ones. But rather, he's looking to be including many.
And he goes on and says, And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Verse 5, This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So we're going in alignment with Ephesians in regards to darkness, that we've been delivered from darkness, we've been brought into the light, therefore, there's no darkness in him at all. He's saying don't have fellowship with darkness in any way, but rather have fellowship with the light. The light is Christ Jesus, the body of Christ, that which is of the character of Christ, the conduct of Christ, the concerns of Christ, that which is of Christ's focus, the kingdom of the Lord, have fellowship there, participate there. That word koinonia, being, being part of fellowship, participating with, a part of. You belong to the body of Christ. Therefore, it says no darkness at all. In this, looking now in the same chapter, uh, 5 and uh, verse um, 6, if we say then that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, what's it say? We lie and do not practice the truth. Therefore, it is not just in the saying, but in the doing and the practice of life shows it. Where we are walking, are we walking in the light, meaning Christ Jesus, in whom there's no darkness at all. It also, remember it says in Scripture that, that there is no shadow or turning with him, meaning he is always 100% at the high point. There's no shadow with him, no turning, no partiality. There's no, there's no darkness at all in him. So in this, he's saying that if we say that we have fellowship with him, and there's a lot of this going on, as you probably have noticed, not only in church history, but today, where there's many, I can't, I, I'm amazed how much I see, and of course, Facebook makes it come alive, where you just have to look on Facebook and you can see Christian stuff on everybody's Facebook. If any, I, we, I can't believe how many Christians there actually are, and yet do not practice the truth, hence proving the evidence that they lie based on what we're seeing here, wouldn't you say? I mean, when you just look and see all of the things that they go to church and talk Jesus and talk Holy Spirit and talk power and spirituality, and I've had numerous conversations with people over the past 20 plus years in ministry that talk Jesus, talk Holy Spirit, quote verses, and oftentimes just a phrase or two that they've picked up over the church world, know the Sunday school stories. But when it comes to actually employing and walking in that faith, walking in the power, trusting in or separating, here's the big one, separating from darkness, they, they, they draw the line and go into the realm of, well, the Lord understands. He judges the heart. He accepts us. He knows where I'm at. He knows I'm trying, and I'm amazed at the, at the multitude of answers that come forth to excuse ourselves for walking in darkness. The TV shows that are watched, the movies that are gone, the things that titillate, the things that draw their attention, and, and it's amazing all the avenues and the goals and the concerns and how many frets that people have that refuse to get past and want everybody to understand their difficulty rather than just truly practicing the truth. So he's calling for us to be people who are Kingdom people, kingdom believers walking in the light in whom there's no darkness at all. I can't imagine going to the Lord, seeing him in his full glory, in his full light, saying, well, you know, it was, it was tough. I, I can't imagine saying, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just, there's no way, when you see him as he is, there is no excuse. There is no valid excuse before the Lord. N not even ignorance. We can't even say, well, you know, I, I didn't know. Because he's already addressed that in Romans, saying that men would be without excuse, that all would be guilty before God. So there is no excuse. It is believe or don't believe. It is walk in the light, walk circumspectly, walk with wisdom. But there is no, well, you know, I hope you understand, I'm trying and... Absolutely, there's an element of you're pursuing, you're going after, there, and there's, but here he addresses that. He addresses that as he goes further now in verse 7. He addresses that. 
idea of, well, you know, what I'm going towards and I'm working towards and I'm trying and, I'm, and, I, and I want the Lord. And absolutely, but he addresses this in verse 7. And he says, but if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with who? One another. Our fellowship with one another is totally dependent upon others walking in the light. That if, if we are looking to walk in darkness, you will find many who will walk with you. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we'll have fellowship with one another, with the Lord, with the Holy Spirit, and with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Notice it is that continual cleansing. It is that continual ongoing, as you walk in the light, you are walking in the cleansing of his blood. That the, no darkness will reside, it is washed clean, it is constantly put behind you. As you walk in the light, as he is in the light, you have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses you from all unrighteousness. That means uh, every time you and I mess up, think wrong, do wrong, as you walk in the light, turning towards him, getting in alignment with his son. All of that is behind you, and you're cleansed by his blood, and you have fellowship with one another. Do you ever notice that when you're going awry, walking in darkness, let, let depression, disbelief, discontent, and all those other D words get a hold of your heart? Disobedience, decadence, all those D words, all those ones. Do you ever notice that when they start getting a hold of you, not like you're just dealing with some issues and having a wrong day, when they start getting a hold of you, do you notice how quickly you don't want to be around believers? Or you're looking for believers who are struggling just like you so that you can have fellowship with them instead? That why is it when somebody's struggling that way and they really don't want to face their sin or their issue, the last thing they want to do is talk to anybody mature in the Lord? But instead they're searching out, why, how do you have a church grow today? Let darkness in. Let the darkness in. That way there's all accepted, all handled, all wonderful, and we'll put, on some, we'll put on some sacredness. We'll make it look a little more sacred and spiritual for you so that you'll feel like you went to church. So you'll feel like you're in the midst of the Holy Spirit. But the way to have fellowship with the Holy Spirit is to walk in the light. That's the only way. Walk in the light. And you'll have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. There is no other way. In this, looking at this verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light. Not just our own concept. Not just our own thoughts of the way it should be. If we walk in the light as he is in the light. His Holy Spirit is the one who makes that possible. Without the Holy Spirit, you and I cannot walk in the light. It is only by his spirit that that is, uh, that is able to happen. But if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Verse 9, but if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How much? All. What do we have to do? Confess. What does that mean? Humility. Confession is bringing it to light. Because, because uh, uh, decay, uh, insects that destroy, termites. You notice they always work in the darkness, in the shadows, in places. You know, moss always grows on the dark side of the tree. You know, all that stuff, there's always, where do mushrooms grow? In the light? No, the fungus grows in the dark. That you always get that element going on. When do the beast come out? At night. So when you start recognizing and realizing that it's in this, this, this hiding this secret, this covering up, that's what the enemy plays. So you bring it to the light. You bring it to the surface. You let it be known. Why? Because does it say, and you will never sin again. Is that what it says? And you will never, ever bring it to the light, and you will never, ever, ever, you'll be sin-free. <laughs> really? Is that what it says? No. It says that if you confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that if we walk in the light as he is in the light, then that blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us. There's a continual cleansing in the light. That new creation in Christ walking circumspectly, realizing that you are walking 
in the light in the midst of a darkened land, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. That idea of the shadow of death is everywhere. Darkness is coming in even now. Here we are at 730 on the eastern seaboard, and you've got that sun going down slowly but surely, and darkness is settling in, and the lights come on. If we didn't have lights, where would we, where would we be? We'd be preparing our, our bed for nighttime, passing the night. My mom tells me, she says, when I, she was growing up as a little girl, trying to save on candles and trying to save on money and oil and things, is that they went to bed really early and would sneak into the covers, and then they would just lay there and talk and, or just lay there waiting for daylight to come. Because you, the only means of light was a little lamp or a little candle or this and that, and those cost money. So those went out and you went to bed. Today we have this artificial lighting they can place, and that's actually, I look at it and say, that's oftentimes what goes on in church world today. We have artificial lighting. And we've created our own means of putting on our own sense of lighting so that we can walk around and say, I'm spiritual and God loves me and I love God. And we've created our own sense of lighting. And we walk in fellowship with one another, but not in him. He's something that we quote, not somebody we lean on. And in this, we have to recognize that God Almighty is bringing us to a state that we would walk in the light as he is in the light. Turn now, if you would, to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians. Chapter 4. Verse 7 and 8, which says, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 7 and 8, For God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who has also given us his Holy Spirit. Holiness has become a word that is just, just seems to be taught in academic worlds, something we read in the Bible but no longer lived out the way it should be. Uncleanness is nothing to do with the Lord. That it is, it is a, an abomination. It is our task by the Spirit to know what it is to walk in the Spirit and what is flesh, what is world, what is darkness. And he has explained it very well that we would have that love for the kingdom. Remember now, your flesh nature, my flesh nature, our natural man loves sin, loves the world, loves what's going on, loves pride, loves lust, loves decadence, loves, meaning what? Loves, goes after. But the Holy Spirit separates, wants nothing to do with it. It's unclean. Now, you look and say, well, unclean, what do you mean unclean? Have you ever been around anybody truly unclean? And you'll realize real quick that you don't want to sit next to them too long. Unclean. That if you've been around anything of a corrupt animal that is in its state of death and it's in a state of corruption, and so you don't want to even be next to it. Unclean. That there's an uncleanness that you withdraw from. It doesn't draw you, you withdraw from. So that, oh, don't even... Touch me. Woo. So I remember this gal at Bible school and she went to a, on the streets for a street evangelism. And, and uh, she says when she was just uh, her first, second semester in her first year, and they went on a street evangelism team in New York and they went down into the, into the bad streets and stuff. And, and there was a poor old lady and all dressed dark and stuff, holding out and looking for, for money or cans or whatever the case, bottles, whatever they're collecting. And she just wanted to go over and pray with her and give her a hug and give her a track. And she went over to, to talk with her and she got close and the woman smelled so bad that she, she was just, it just, she just drew back. It just hit her. And then she looked and she saw bugs all around the woman's neck she, where she didn't want to even touch the woman anymore. And she realized that that's what we're capable of being, that my shower and my clean clothes stop me from being that. But that's what I am. I'm unclean, and I withdraw from. And it came to an understanding of what that really looks like. We're, we, without Christ, are unclean before him. There's no presence. There's no fellowship. That, that there's a withdrawing from. 
But when you walk in the light as he is in the light, you have fellowship with one another. How are you doing? Good to see you. Let's pray together. Let's talk about Christ. What's going on in the kingdom? Christ is coming. The kingdom. No, I don't want to do that. I don't watch that. I don't go there. No, that's not the words that I use. Those aren't jokes I don't laugh at. You, there's a withdrawing from. They think you're being a nut. Right? Anyone who is contrary. Or those who, are, who proclaim Christ but live that way think you are holier than thou but they don't practice the truth. Therefore, what's the Bible say? They're liars. They don't practice the truth. He's calling for us to have fellowship with him is to practice the truth and to withdraw from uncleanness. First place to start is where? Our own lives. But there's also an uncleanness in the body that he's also calling for us to withdraw from as we'll be getting into as we proceed. Now, in this, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 5, or let's start with verse 4, 4 and 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 4 and 5, But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief, meaning the day of the Lord. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the light, we are not of the night, nor of darkness. He's calling for the church to walk in the light. Now, if he's warning and writing to the church to walk in the light, if John is writing to the church to walk in the light, if he wrote to the church in Ephesus and said, to be people of the light, you've been translated, don't do this, meaning, what's been going on in the church? <laughs> there's, a, there's a darkness that has infiltrated. There's a problem in the church. There's a lack of understanding. There's a worldliness. There's a carnal nature. There's devils at work seeking to put a, a wet blanket over the light. And Jesus says, don't let you cover your light. To be instead, even as a one light, let it shine. Don't put a covering over it. So this has been going on since the church was birthed. This isn't like just in the 21st century here, 2013, we've been dealing with this now for, no, this has been going on since the church was birthed. This has been going on since the days of Moses when he first introduced the idea of clean and unclean. The whole idea of going back and recognizing that God has been displaying his character of holiness since the very beginning and calling for a people to walk in the light and to be that way. And how can we be so? We need his spirit. And it is only by faith looking for, believing in the promises of God, the word of God, and living a life for the things of God. In this, we have to recognize that all things are of Christ. He is the light of the world, as he said. Just as that sun rises over the horizon, and there's no darkness in the sun where it just, it just comes over that horizon, and the, the, he doesn't chase. Do you notice that the light doesn't chase the darkness away? The, the darkness flees. The darkness runs from its very presence. It's all powerful presence over darkness. And we have to recognize that, that Christ is the victor. There's no weakness in him. Think of it. There's no weakness in him. There's no death, disease, pestilence, weakness. There's no feebleness in Christ. Sometimes I've heard people pray or talk in such a way that they, they think that, that Christ and the devil are like these two opposing forces that are battling, but it's already been proclaimed that, that one day Christ wins. And, and they portray it in talk and even in theological circles, portray it in such a way as though the devil and Christ are kind of like evenly matched, but we know that Christ will one day win. That is a false, a wickedly false understanding, devilishly inspired to, to elevate the devil to be a greater being than he is. He's a rat walking in the avenues of the darkness of the city sore. And, and you get the Lion of Judah. That there's a, a current um, picture that is on Facebook and on the internet in a variety of ways, and people have sent it to me in a variety. I don't think anybody from this church, I was thankful, but, the, uh, but I get it from others who are promoting this idea of Jesus and the devil locking arms in an arm wrestling match. And 
Jesus is, is the king and, and the devil is this fierce looking character and they're arm locked and they're ready to do arm wrestling battle and, the, and the, but Christ is the victor. That's a, although it may inspire you to look and say, yeah, that's Jesus up against this ferocious enemy. But in actuality, that's a false portrayal. That instead, it should be Christ Almighty with his foot on the neck. That wiggle and worm as much as you want. But you're going nowhere. And anyone who is in Christ, even if they're the bottom scale of my big toe is still above you. That they're in the body of Christ and the, 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 the smallest of molecule or DNA picture of my smallest toenail is greater than you. But we like to portray oftentimes in church world as this great match taking place and, and Jesus and we're in this huge battle going on. And Absolutely. You know what the battle is? Him against my flesh nature. But against the spirit man, there is no match. I'm in the body of Christ. And if I walk in the light as he is in the light, there is no... We like to think of Star Wars, the dark force and the, and the light force. And, and we have the Star Wars spirituality going on. And kids like it. And, and, and preachers even preach it because it excites us. But what's it exciting is the flesh nature. It doesn't move a person to maturity. It doesn't per move a person to understand the great power of, and the victory of Christ. But we like to see the, the kind of like the, the light and the dark, and the, the darkness is stronger, but the light has the light sword, and, and they, they fight, and one talks in a loud and growling voice, and, and, it's, and these two opposing forces, and trust the force, Luke. And, you know, it's that kind of stuff, and we're back and forth, and, and we've taken this model and have put, taken this devilish model and put it in the church. We really have. And, and we're looking for the Jedi preacher to show up. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Obi-Wan. <laughs> Call me Cody one. No, just <laughs> edit that. <laughs> but that's, so we're looking, and they're looking for that deliverer to come and that one with the lightsaber who will save the day and warp against this, this force and Saints, it's a, it's a bad portrayal. That the Bible says that you are more than conquerors. That you're victorious. That you're a son of the living God. Children of the light. Of no darkness. The power that the devil has over you is just the power over the darkness in your life. But no, nothing over the light in your life. That's why you'll hear me all the time say to walk in the light. Trust the Lord. Get on your knees. Call upon God. Separate from darkness. Don't let that into your house. Don't marry into that. Don't go into business with that. Stay away from that. Don't feel, who, well, don't you think that we should be? Oh, yeah, here we go. You're going to start. It's instead, what's the Bible say? Separate from. Get away from. Don't participate with. Don't get involved with. There's got to be this withdrawal. Well, they're going to hate me. They're going to say things. Oh, it's so difficult. And then they start up and... And you end up with this kind of stuff going on. I'm telling you this today because there's a fellowship that is in Christ that is superior to anything of this world and anything of the devil that he has no sway over your new man. And the failure of the church has been trying to get people to think that this ferocious enemy is out to get you and that you have no control over, you have no power over, no victory over, and you're constantly on your knees crying out to deliver you from this devil rather than realizing you're in the body of Christ. And that devil is under your feet. And you can walk in victory today. And you can walk with freedom and power and light and, to, and, 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 and instead of the pride and the, and the lust and the decadence and the disobedience disrupting your life, you can shake that off and you don't have to wait till two years and three years. Sometimes it takes that long for us to get a hold of it and understand it and deliver it and separate from. Sure, that's why it says to walk in the light. That's why it says in the blood of Jesus Christ will cleanse you from all sin. To, you'll be to repent, to turn away from, to turn to. There is no Star Wars type uh, good force, bad force. Is there evil in the world? Sure. Where's the evil? In the world. Your flesh nature, your carnal man, in league with. But in Christ Jesus, it is total light, total victory, total power. Our task is to get up every day, 
Crucify the old and walk in the new. That's how easy it is. That's how hard it is. Right? In this, another aspect of it is the, the yin and the yang type thinking. That's really what's at work with the good force and bad force of Star Wars. That's what's really at work in this Jesus and devil locking and arm wrestling to battle. It's the yin and the yang thinking of, a, of, of Eastern thinking, of Eastern religion, where the yin and the yang are needed to balance off each one, that to have light, you have darkness. To have strength, you need weakness. That you work, compare, and contrast, and they balance each other off. That's not so. That in Christ Jesus is light, and there is no darkness at all. There is no weakness at all. There is no feebleness at all. There is no death in him at all. Rather, the only way that you have, have darkness is to have absence of light. That's the only way it has presence. That's the only way it has power, is to have the absence of light. They're not equal forces. The only reason you have death reigning in this world is because there's an absence of life. When there's life, there's no death. When life is present, there's no death. Death is the evidence that life has been removed. So when we start recognizing instead that, that the only way that evil, the only way that bad is present is because good isn't. So good, the absence of good, the absence of light, the absence of light gives place to these things. But there's no equal power. There's no balancing act going on. There's no yin and yang. That's devilish thinking. There's no Jedi type force against dark force, Jedi force working, yin and yang. And No. It is foolishness that has entered into the church world and the theological realms, and people are thinking and they're leading their life this way that I have to be stronger today. I have to, be, I have to, opera, I have to beat the devil down today. You don't have to get up and beat the devil down today. Just walk in the light. It, there's a freedom in it. Walk in the light. That's it. You don't see me getting up every day. I've got to do battle today. I've got I've to get up and do my battles. I've got to take out my, my prayer cards and walk around and do my prayer cards and choke to freedom, freedom, freedom. It's absolutely ridiculous. I've, got, I've seen people that take their Bibles and the Bible says to stand on the Word. They put it on the floor and they stand on it. Oh, yeah, devils are afraid of you. It's crazy stuff. But that's what we're doing, trying to, trying to make ourselves look spiritual and powerful and move devils. And You want to move devils? Do good. Do right. Trust in the Lord. They'll be moving. They'll be moving against you, over you, around you, planning against you, scheming. Do not fear. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. You're in the body of Christ. Nothing can come your way unless he's permitting it, ordaining it, or doing something. And if he's allowing it to come, he's going to deliver you from something. He's going to help someone else. But he's always, every good and perfect gift comes from above. Is there an amen in the house? Amen. It is coming into the freedom that you get up in the morning and you don't have to fight devils all day long. The only reason that devils have a war over you is because you're walking in the natural man. When we walk in the natural, that's why Jesus said to... Pick up your cross. Deny yourself. Pick up your cross. Because then you've just eliminated the devil's power over you. And it's learning to instead just say, Lord, I'm going to praise you. Will devilish thoughts come? Oh, yeah. Will bad days come? Oh, yeah. Will it be some days where you feel like you don't have any victory at all? Sure. And those days will sometimes turn into a month. But the word says, not your feelings, the word says that I'm more than a conqueror. I'm an ambassador of peace. I'm an ambassador of Christ. That I'm a child of God. I'm a citizen of heaven. I'm a I am. I'm going to praise you. I don't want to. I know, you know I'm having problems today, Lord. Remember, I'm but flesh. But you put your spirit in me. You go to the word of God. You kick it in. You stand up and you walk as a man. You walk as a person of God. You walk as that, that person. And you realize there's times where you don't feel like going in and talking with it. Absolutely. But instead, you recognize that that devil is not my problem. My problem is in that mirror. That's my problem. My problem is this flesh nature. My problem is this sin that reigns. I want to do it my way. I want it to go my way. I'm impatient. I'm impudent. I'm this. I'm that. I'm insolent. I'm, I'm impertinent. I've got, I'm indulgent. I've I got problems. Lord, I need you. 
And all of a sudden you start recognizing, Savior's coming alive in me. And you start breaking free from that day, and you move on with your day. You move on. You go to bed at night, and you put your head to the pillow and say, Lord, I'm yours. Devils are out to disturb it. Absolutely. But you have fellowship with him. He didn't withdraw his fellowship from you. Ever. Nothing can separate you. What's the Bible say? Romans 8. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. Why do we act as though the devil is doing that? He's not. But he's making it a feel like it is. He's making it look like it is. Remember this past Sunday sermon in regards to the, the devil, your adversary, the devil, roams around, right? Roaring, right? Like a lion. Like a lion. He'll make you feel a certain way, think a certain way, counterfeit, put on and make it look and feel like there's nobody. There's, how many times have you felt that nobody, nobody loves you? You know what that's actually revealing? Self. Because all we're thinking about is <laughs> myself, right? Elijah went to the Lord. There's nobody but me. I alone. Basically, paraphrasing Gary Cody version, he says, stop it. There's 7,000 others who haven't bowed the knee to Baal. Just in case you thought you were alone, I have reserved 7,000. It's not about you, Elijah. So in this, we start recognizing, I'm going to praise you, trust you. And we start recognizing that, that, that you are victorious in him and you have fellowship with him. Fellowship. Fellowship in the Holy Spirit. Christ is your victor. Fully, completely, absolutely. There is no feebleness in him. There's no death in him. There's no lie in him. There's no darkness, and there shouldn't be in those who call upon his name as well. Amen? He's called us out of uncleanness into cleanness. He's called us out of darkness into light, out of death into life. He's called us out of this world and into the kingdom. He's called us out of this temporal body and into the body of Christ. He's called us out of sin and into spirituality. He's called us out of this world and says, and I will be a father to you. Instead, we must trust that and know that his word is all powerful. It is sufficient for me. And I'm not going to go based on what I feel or what I think or what, what my past offenses were or the way I'd like to see it work out. But instead, it's I'm going to trust in the Lord. Now, in this, there are disruptors in the fellowship. There are disruptors. That the enemy works through the weaknesses of man. Not everybody is at a state of maturity. Not everybody is complete in him. Some people love the world more than they love Christ, but call upon. Remember, not everybody practices the truth. Many people talk about it's in the world. It's in our church. It's in our fellowships. It's, it's going to happen. So that's why people oftentimes will come in and say, well, that's why the church should be, and why can't it be? Because it can't be because it can't be. Make sense? It can't be because it can't be. There's always going to be disruptions, discontent, problems in the faith. Just when you think you've got the church right where you want it, you'll end up with 20 people who come visiting who bring in all their baggage. Somebody will get saved ha! and cause problems. Why does it have to be this way? Why does it have to be there? How come we can't? Just not too long ago, a, a fellow got saved here right at this church. And uh, about six months ago, and, and, he was, uh, he, and he made an altar call. And he goes, you know, when I first came to this church, I was really bothered. He says, you know, I, I didn't see a lot of any religious stuff. And he felt it's not like a real church. And it was bothered with this and bothered there wasn't a, where's the cross and where's the, and he goes, and I saw the cross. I said, oh, there is a cross there. It's right here on the podium, right here. He goes, and I didn't realize that. And, but that, that's what was bothering him. And I says, well, you'll notice that the church body is more interested in having the cross in your heart rather than on the wall. 
goes, oh, I didn't think of that. It's like a revelation, right? It's the cross in the heart that we are told to have. The cross that says no to the things, you have a new life and took some explanation. But do you see that just when you think that everybody's going to be and all of a sudden you get this new influx and this new fight and this new problem and, and it's just going to, it's always going to be that way. There's going to be disruptions in the church, but there are those who disrupt for the sake of disrupting. There are those who operate in a, in a darkened state, in a state of discontent and unbelief that we must always be aware of. There are those who are decadent because they have a love for decadence, though they come to church. I'm not saying this church. I'm saying church, that there's always going to be those who gather together with the body, wherever it may be, whether it's a cell group or a church meeting or a church men's group fellowship or whether it's a women's group fellowship or wherever there's a gathering, there's always the potential of those who come in there's going to be those who are immature in their faith or do not have an understanding in a certain degree or have struggles and pains in their life that they have not yet overcome. Always going to have that. A striving and a coming to know and a dealing with themselves as all the things we talked about. But you also have to remember there's always those who are disruptors because that's what they, do, that's what they are. That there's those who have a love for decadence or a love for disobedience or a love for deception that always are also have access and they'll always be looking for the weak ones. They'll always be looking for the ones who they can tap into to influence, to cause disruption. And we have to recognize that. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 1, let brotherly love continue. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 1 says, let brotherly love continue. But you will deal with disruptors. That's what I call them, disruptors, dealing with disruptors. Not everyone is for the unity of the Spirit. Fellowship in the Holy Spirit, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit means unity and communion. But not everybody who is among you wants unity of the Spirit. But they want unity, meaning their version of it. Just as with truth, people say, I want the truth, but they want it their version. So it is... I know what you're saying, or I've even had people, and maybe you've had people say to you, I know what the Bible says, but, and then give their version of the way it should be. Meaning then you really don't want the truth. You want your version. Well, the same thing is true with fellowship. There are those who aren't really looking for fellowship in the Holy Spirit. They're looking for spiritual fellowship, but not the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. In this, there's a spirituality connected to it. There's a flattery that takes place. There's a deception and a perversion of the truth. There's some Jesus talk, God talk, there's kingdom talk. There's, there's things that take place. There's church service fellowship. But they're really looking for a version of fellowship, not the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. They want it according to their plan, their standard, their ideas, their ideals the way they envision the way it should be. I've come across this oftentimes where people are looking for basically a campground type Christianity. I think I've mentioned this in time past, campground type Christianity. You know campground where you gather around the fire? You don't really see each other really well. But it's everybody's just singing a few songs, fellowshipping, having a little snack to eat. You just enjoy one another's company knowing that when it's all over, you can go your own way. You're not really connected to anyone, or if you are, it's short-lived because you can just go your own way. You can sing songs, talk superficial talk, cook some marshmallows or s'mores, enjoy one another's company, and then go and live your life. Campground-type Christianity is prevalent today. It's called, I call it socially acceptable Christianity where we have fellowship among ourselves and we keep it social, but it's not spiritual. In this, I like to think of it, and I was watching these commercials on planet fitness spirituality. What is one of the catchy phrases for planet fitness? Right? The, the no judgment zone. That's what we have today, the no judgment zone. Everybody's operating with this no judgment zone. In the sense of that, they 
you, who made you the judge of me? You're not supposed to tell me how to live. Who do you think you are? I'm going to go in there and just lead my, I go exercise at my own pace. No one, no, you're just there, you're there to help me with what I need, not tell me what to do. And we have this planet fitness type, no judgment zone, go at my own pace, exercise with guidance if you want it, don't disturb others, don't disturb me, accept everybody, encourage everybody, leave everybody alone. Everyone's welcome. We're here for you. It's okay if you're struggling, just keep trying. You're doing well, you're a great person. Just coast for a while, that's okay too. Take a break, it's okay. Come back when you're ready. It's Planet Fitness Christianity. And there's no come together and hold one another accountable, encourage one another. What happened to iron sharpens iron? Why don't we have that as our exercise club? Iron sharpens iron fitness club. We'll hold you accountable. We'll yell at you. We'll move your head, but you'll love the end product. Nobody wants that. No, that. We'd have no one coming. In this, we have entered into the age once again, as we've seen plagued in Christian circles in time past, is a Unitarianism or slash a universalism. This Unitarianism, this universalism, is that basically says that everyone's accepted. There's really no holiness. No one goes to hell. Everybody is loved by God, and he loves everybody. And we're seeing this today. This is what destroyed Harvard. It's what destroyed Yale. Harvard was destroyed from within, not from without. Harvard was established for the purpose to give glory to God and to raise up leaders to run this country knowing that anybody who did not have Christ and a full understanding of Christ was not worthy of leadership. And Harvard University was established, Harvard College, and a library given to train ministers to better run the country and leadership, and they needed ministers as well. In this, universalism got in, and the whole idea within just a generation or two destroyed Harvard. Whereas the entire focus of Harvard was lost because instead it became that they're, they're, everyone's going to heaven, God loves everybody, You're, he's, he's too good to send anybody uh, in, uh, for eternal punishment, and you're too wonderful to deserve it. That's really what it comes down to, is he's too good and you're too wonderful. And so in this, it got in there whereas it destroyed the gospel, whereas there's really sinners is just a word that keeps you down and outcast. The word sin is really not something you should be preaching. Preaching instead saintliness and, and spirituality and goodness and, and love one another. These are acceptable words. Is that not in the church world today? And it destroyed Harvard. So the church leaders raised up Yale in replacement of Harvard. And Yale ended up going the same way within a generation or two. Within just 40 to 80 years, lost. Same thing, universalism got in. The idea of the holiness of God, the idea of sinfulness, the idea of fellowship with the God is separation from the world. That's all just, that's all old stuff. That's all old doctrines. We've, we're sophisticated. We're, we've now come into the age of reason and understanding, and this is archaic. We don't need this anymore. That's not, and they've, by doing so, by thinking that way, the Holy Spirit is removed from church world. Because the Holy Spirit and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit says, come out from among them. Come into the state of cleanness. Come into light. You have fellowship with one another. So that kind of thinking, and it's in the church world today. It's right here in our own area. That this is the talk that goes on. They don't want to talk this, this mean talk. And, and anyone who's bringing up holiness is deemed judgmental, is holier than now. Anyone who talks with a sharper edge or holds their ground, I've talked to them to my dear sister Jen, you've experienced just telling someone the truth, saying, what are you doing? Has immediately brought in as to who made you the judge of me. I'm actually, the love, I'm reaching out, trying to help you. This is not healthy for you. I've seen Kara have to deal with it, my own wife deal with it. Just, I can't imagine someone thinking that Kara's thinking wrongly of someone, and yet that's what they thought. Why? Because she wanted them to, this isn't healthy for you. What are you doing? The carnality, that's what the devil works. Separate yourself from, you're, you're destroying your future. There's no, he's not into that. He withdraws from, it's unclean. 
Bible uses the word hate. The Bible uses the word hate. Tough words. But hate meaning I have no part in, no parcel in, I don't identify with, I reject. Actually, I turn away from and have no fellowship with or participation with. I have, there's nothing in common. There's no link, no talk, nothing. There's a hate. So we have to recognize that. We have to know that the fellowship of the Holy Spirit is moving us to cause separation, not for, for your own sake. Remember, the bad apple in the good apple barrel is a good experiment as to what takes place in the, in the spirit realm. So true? One bad apple in the whole barrel of good, what happens? They're all bad. One good apple in the bad barrel, the one turns bad. Nothing turns good. Evil company corrupts good behavior. That's what the Bible says, Old Testament and New Testament. Evil company corrupts good behavior. So you can do well and also say, what's happening? Why is this going on? Towards the end of Paul's ministry, he mentions a guy by the name of Demas. And he says, Demas has forsaken me, loving the world. Forsaken, loving the world. A falling away. It takes place. It's in the church world. It was then, it is now. It has been through church history. There's devils at play. There's worldliness and unbelievers at play. But there's disruptors operating right inside our own realm. Some through immaturity. They're looking for growth. They're looking for maturity, and we help them, absolutely. But there's disruptors that actually move in and amongst. There's those who need to be set straight and want to be set straight. And then there are those who will never be set straight, and they're still in the body. They're still moving, I mean, in the assembly. In this, we have to understand it. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. This is a difficult word. Difficult word to receive, difficult word to understand, and difficult word to deliver because it can be so easily misconstrued. It can be so easily made to sound like something it's not supposed to be where the enemy can really twist words or pervert it in some way or, or cause a misunderstanding. So it's very important to understand this all from a biblical perspective and realize that there's devils in the world working through our flesh nature that there's unbelievers in the world of darkness that is operating who don't have a clue of anything to do with the spirit realm or, or I should say with the Holy Spirit and the kingdom and don't receive it and they work against and they oppose and they're filled with darkness. But there's darkness also working through disrupting through those of unbelief, those who don't practice the truth that speak it and they operate in the church and there's those who are that way who need to be turned around and then there are others who are that way and will never be turned around. And it is for us to know the difference. We'll be coming to that at a later time where I think it's Jude addresses that. The, God, the, the letter by Jude addresses that issue. But for now, looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 1 through 5, says, It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and such, and such sexual immorality as not even named among the Gentiles, that a man has his father's wife. And you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. What's it say? Taken away from among you. For indeed, an absent in body, for I indeed am as absent in body, but present in spirit have already judged. What did he do? He judged. As though I were present, him who has so done this deed. Verse 4. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, verse 5, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit might be saved in the day of our Lord Jesus. Hey, that's a tough word. You know, that's not the kind of word you get up on Sunday morning and preach to have everybody walk out blessed. Deliver such a one to Satan. Meaning... This is what's taken place. I've judged that it's, isn't that what Paul said? Though I'm not there, I judge it correctly. This is evil. That's not of the Holy Spirit. This is not healthy for you as the body. Deliver such a one. Remove him from you and deliver him to Satan, the adversary. Why? 
for the destruction of the flesh. Why? So he could be saved. See the intent? It's not just to punish him, get away with it. It's your, your concern, your love is to do this. Love is motivating. So that, that's what will take place. Why is it today when we talk about anything to do with that, it's you're harsh, you're, 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 you're difficult, you're not tolerant, you're, when in actuality, love is what's motivating for this to take place. Is that making sense? So in this, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9, I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people. Don't even keep company with them. Isn't that what he's saying? Don't keep company with them. Verse 10, Yet I certainly did not mean with sexually immoral people of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or idolaters since then you would need to go out of the world. What's he saying? That it's in the church. When that is in your assembly among the church, separate yourself from it because what? They don't practice the truth. It's on their lips, but they're not practicing it, saying step away from them. They're a cancer. Turn them over. Why? For destruction of that flesh nature. So they will come to their senses and what? Save their spirit. Save them. But he's saying, but the world can't help but be that, just like you and I couldn't. The world out there, if you try to say, I'm going to stay away from everybody who's a liar, everybody who's an extortioner, everyone who practices deception, everyone who's immoral, I'm staying away from, you better pick up hermithood. And then you're still going to deal with you. True? So that's what he's saying is that, but when they're claiming to be among you and they're not, that's not fellowship of the Holy Spirit. And you can't win them over by just being kind. According to this, you cannot win them over by being kind. That, verse 11, But now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. Isn't that a strong word? Why don't we, why aren't we practicing, why aren't people living this way? Oh, I don't want them to think this of me. You call yourself a Christian. Aren't you supposed to be understanding, loving, and polite? Their concept of Christianity is warped. Better to understand who you are in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. If I walk in the light as he is in the light. Well, that's when somebody will kick back and say, well, Jesus ate with sinners. Shouldn't we be? He ate with also sinners. What did Paul just write? I'm not saying to go out of the world. They're, they're everywhere. Those who are among you. But remember with Jesus, he ate with sinners? No, he didn't. They ate with him. Big difference. Big difference. They didn't, he didn't go around and, and eat with sinners. He says, I'm going to be at your place. I'm going to eat at your place. I'm coming to your house. Or I'm going there. They came and ate with him. Do you think that he became like them so that they would like him? No. He held his ground. He's the Christ. No darkness in him at all. They changed their practice to be around him. And they came to the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. It says in 2 Corinthians 2.9, at some point, look this up. Oh, wait a minute, I want to see a verse five, chapter 5, verse 13. But those who are outside God judges, therefore put away from yourselves the evil person. What's he call them? The evil person. Those who are on the outside, God will judge. That's when it says do not judge. The, the whole world, anyone who does not know the Lord, they're already, they're lost, they're darkened. They don't know any better than to do what they're doing. Does that mean we don't preach to them? No, it means we do. But knowing this, that God is the one who will judge them. But those who are on the inside, those who are in the assembly, those who are of the church, those who claim Christ, those who belong to, what's he saying? Put away from yourselves that evil person, not to be part of. Good company is corrupted by bad. By bad. Coming into the understanding of 
who you and I are in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, who he is. Watch Paul, how he operated. Peter, how he operated. Stephen, and all of these great church people of church history that there wasn't a communion with and a longing for. Today, we have picked up the mantle of worldliness and look just like it in order to try to appeal to, titillate, draw crowds, get people to come in. But the Holy Spirit is greatly lacking, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit is absent. And if the fellowship of the Holy Spirit is absent, then the power is too. That's why you don't have power to change lives. So, in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, Paul writes his novel letter to them, following up on this one, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, and says, reaffirm your love to him. Reaffirm your love to him. The man who he just said to cast aside, remove from you for the destruction of the flesh, for his immorality, repented. And he's saying, stop driving him away. Rather, since he's repented, accept him, lest the judgment be too hard for him to handle. The man repented from these actions and turned back. And it says, Paul writing to them in chapter 2, verse 9, says, reaffirm your love to him. Go to them. Reaffirm it. Let them know. Because there was a repentance that took place. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 8 through 10. He says, that we are not to do wrong and to cheat. Not to do these things to our brethren. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators or idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, sodomites, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. None of them. None of it. It's all of the flesh nature. And God is not going to play partiality and say, well, that one went to church and that one did call upon my name at a time. Whoever aligns themselves with any of that, they will also be cut off. And he's calling for those who are of the body to come out from that uncleanness, come away from that evil person, put him aside. But notice as we talked about with that, that man and that, he says, Put them on that white foot. Turn them over. Why? Destruction of the flesh. Why? To save the, to save the man's soul. But we have to understand that there's, there's, there's a, a disruption that takes place in the unity. Do you think that when they were going through that in the church at Corinth, do you think that maybe it was causing problems in the church? And do you think when Paul writes and they read this letter and said, wow, he's really serious, you mean, do you think that maybe that, we read the letter as though not sometimes realizing that that really took place and that somebody had to convene, somebody had to make that decision, somebody had to say, you're not welcomed here anymore. This is not acceptable. We need change behavior. And if you're going to do this, somebody had to make that decision. True? Somebody then had to hold to that decision. So the church makes that decision and that man was put out what about all those who maybe said that was too harsh, Paul is off, the church body shouldn't have done that, the elders should have been more caring, that's not the love of God, and they all and go and chase him and put their arms around him and just say, we're sorry, that was too harsh, we didn't mean, that's not what they should have done, let's start our own church. Did you help that man at all? Did that person help that man at all? Not one bit. You just put yourself in league with the devil. The man was just cast off, is working the same works of darkness that has nothing to do with the Lord. And in your great care and concern and in, and in counterfeit love, went and took a hold and put the arm around and we're sorry because you want to show how spiritual and loving you are when actually it's counterfeit love. The real love was holding the decision and aligning yourself with that decision to say that's not acceptable. That's not good. That's not healthy because I have fellowship with the Holy Spirit. This church is of the Holy Spirit. This family, your own family, you'll have to make that decision. It's tough. I've got witness. It's tough. Kara, it's tough. Not fun, not easy. I take no joy in it, and neither does the Holy Spirit. But to have fellowship with the Holy Spirit requires this. Remember now, we're talking about those who are in the body. 
who claim to be, who say, talk with, those who are outside and have not a clue what's going on, they don't even know this is wrong. Or if they know it's wrong, they don't have enough care to change it. That doesn't mean there's a participation in a communion with them. Rather, there's an understanding that God will judge. Hopefully, I'm communicating this correctly for you. Because this can be really misconstrued and be difficult. In this, there is division in church. There is disruption. There is discontent. There is doubt. And it is in the church. And the interesting part in it all is that sin has a name. Sin has a name. Sin has a face. Devils will work through people. Weakness of man and carnal nature has a face, has a name. There was a time in my life where my name and my face meant promoting that which wasn't godly. It's true. I was, went to church, was on the deacon's board, Sunday school teacher, grew up Catholic, had all my stories in alignment, but I did not know the truth. I did not understand holiness. And this born-again thing was way beyond me. And could so easily align myself with carnality, I could come up with the coarsest jokes you ever heard. I could be the life of the party and spark fun in any group with the coarsest of jokes at any time. And it was all fun. And I could do it right there at that church that I was going to and get togethers and talk and fun till Christ introduced me. That in this, coming to understand the Holy Spirit, unraveling and changing and recognizing that he's not here to refurbish that old nature, he's here to cut it away. And so will I now still have a link with and participation and communion with, God forbid, I've cut away from. Do I understand where that carnal man, that unsaved man is coming from? Sure do. But when somebody is in the church and proclaiming that name, has cried out and called upon, says they live for and yet live contrary to, what's the Bible say? Liars. Separate yourself from. What's he call him? Evil person. This is the seriousness of it. And the day will declare it when the, when the light shall be seen and the sons of light will be made known. Is that not what Romans said? The sons of light. The sons of darkness, sons of disobedience, sons of the devil will be cast aside. And the sons of light will be made known. The revealing of the sons of God. The revelation that takes place but as we go through our study and our next one, I plan to address that sin has a name. The fellowship of the Holy Spirit is calling for us to be holy, separate from, called out from, living for, calling it what it is. Paul said, I judge it even though I'm not there. Separate, put aside. But the intent is always from a loving heart taking no joy in seeing that man's pain. Was it difficult in the church? I'm sure it was. But somebody had to make that decision, and somebody did. Somebody had to align themselves with that decision, and they did. What was the benefit of it? The man was saved and returned and restored into the church body. Who was the one who really loved the man? There are those, though, that will operate in the church who will truly deceive and disrupt. And they have names. And next class, I want to bring you through the biblical idea of that sin has a name, disruption. That there are people that are operated in the church that the Holy Spirit has captured for us in the biblical record to help us to understand the need to recognize that not everybody who claims to be Christ is Christ. Not everybody who puts, I'm a Christian, is a Christian. Not everybody who says, I'm for the Lord, is operating with a maturity. And not everybody has the love of God operating. A lot of self-indulgence that still operates. We are to recognize that, to mature and to understand that there are dis there's disruption in the body and it will always be that way till the Lord comes back. In this, this body 
MVC, and anyone who ever hears this message, needs to recognize it, understand it, and move upon trying to help people to grow in the Lord, repent, come into fellowship with the Holy Spirit, but to just be spiritual and loving according to our own version for the sake of trying to prove ourselves Christian, you will always find yourself at fault. You cannot have an emotionally charged decision and come right with God. You cannot be impulsive or emotional or feelings decision making your decisions. It must be according to the Word of God and recognizing that the fellowship of the Holy Spirit is more than just getting along, holding hands, being polite to one another, smiling, and going our own way. Fellowship of the Holy Spirit is serious business. It's coming into oneness with the body of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless. Father in heaven, I thank you for your goodness and I thank you for your grace. I thank you, Lord of glory, that you have saved our souls. And I ask, Lord, that you would move in our lives to make us not only saved souls, but to live a saved life. To live a life of faithfulness, a life of humility, a life of holiness, a life of love. That we are having fellowship with the Holy Spirit and oneness with who you are. I pray, Lord, for your protection, not to fall prey to that which is not of you, but to live for the things of God with a zeal, with a fervor, with a desire, with a love, and to recognize, Lord, that we are to align ourselves with you and no other. Let us not be deceived, but to recognize that if we align ourselves with the, with the world's sins, with the world's problems, then we alike will receive the same, just as this poor man named Achan, who long ago aligned himself with Jericho and lost he and his family. Lord of glory, be with us. Empower us. Give us discernment of spirit. Give us a faith to believe. Move upon us in such a way that we have a desire to know you and that we would live for the kingdom of God with a zeal and a passion, knowing that time is short. Show us, we pray, Lord God, what needs to be said and done, how to handle offense, how to handle confrontation. We don't, we don't want it. We don't welcome it. We don't look for it. But prepare us for it knowing, Lord of glory, that we're seekers after God. We want your righteousness, your holiness. We want your goodness alive in our hearts, minds, and souls, and everyone else we come into contact with, that we would, we would help them to overcome themselves and come into right understanding of who they are in Christ Jesus. Lord of glory, give us a newfound understanding, for it's in your name. Amen and amen. God bless everyone. Have a great night. Thank you for coming out for this class. Enjoy one another's company. God bless.